So what I want to talk about is a little bit about decision making, uh, a little bit about research opportunities and challenges. I'm mostly drawing on some work that I've done and, and collaborations that I've had in the past. And then sort of as, a, as an entryway into what Drs. Barr, Parks, and Wong are going to uh, talk about. So it's, it's an interesting um, collection of talks, and I, I, I think I'm, look forward to hearing them. Um, so we all know what pesticides are, I, but I, I always stick this in at the beginning just to remind me of what a wide range of things actually qualify as pesticides and why we're concerned. I mean, they're, they're compounds obviously designed to kill various sorts of pests or discourage their activities. And um, we have all these longstanding concerns. The things that, that have sort of motivated me professionally as I've, I've worked in this field and, and in the, the general field of environmental health has been this, this issue of what, what are people exposed to and how can we prevent it. And in my mind, there's sort of two issues. One is the stuff that's, that's short term. Um, what's the, if you're out there spraying pesticides, what are you exposed to in, in the short run? And how do we uh, protect you against that? What are the, it, what's interesting is that for a lot of things, it breaks down to what are we exposed to for short periods of time because they break down either in the environment or bodies or both, or things that hang around for long periods of time, which is where actually a lot of the research is now because things, uh, a lot of the persistent pesticides um, uh, are still present in the environment and in our bodies, and, and there's an increasing uh, body of science showing that uh, there's subtle and not so subtle effects that, uh, that we're concerned about. So uh, in thinking about this, you know, as, as an environmental health scientist, we typically break these things down into two bins, either, you know, cancer, which is a big bin, obviously, but the, the other bin is these, what I'm calling here, non-cancer health effects, and the, the things like the neurobehavioral effects. Uh, which uh, the, the underlying chemistry of a lot of the pesticides are to interfere with the, the, the development and or function of the nervous system in, across species or within particular target pests. Um, but as we move forward, as, as our science has gotten better, as we've been allowed to do more interesting studies because we have better tools, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real movement into looking at uh, exposures and chronic and health effects such as chronic diseases and um, I'll talk a little bit about, I, I was just in Chicago earlier this week at a meeting where I was brought in just to talk about uh, how you would go about looking at pesticide exposures or persistent organic pollutant exposures uh, in relation to uh, diabetes. Um, but some of our speakers today, Dana, or Christine, you're going to talk about uh, ADHD, is that, or no, Parkinson's, I'm sorry. And Dana's going to talk about ADHD. And, and autoimmune disease, which are, are not areas where I have much expertise. So um, I'll, I'll let, I'll obviously let them speak um, on those issues. And then uh, Dr. Wong is going to talk about bed bugs, and, uh, which is a, uh, it, what's old is new. Um, all right. Um, this is sort of a, one of the other hats I do as a, as a professor is I teach and have for a number of years have taught a course in, in risk assessment, which is, um, you know, to sort of paraphrase Winston Churchill, the worst form of decision making, except for all the others that have been tried, um, around h how we use science to to affect uh, you know sort of chemical use policy. And I put this in here just to, to sort of as a place make, or a place marker, so to think about how, or at least present how we as a as a society have typically approached things that that. There are risks to everything. Zero risk is unachievable. The, a lot of what government policy around uh, pesticides and hazardous chemicals is is about how do we go about managing the risk, and a lot of that is figuring out how what's the magnitude of the risks and who's susceptible. You know, so and this gets into the second point on this slide, the risk estimation thing. You know, for scientists like myself, um, it's good to go to forums like this that are, are broader because it's. For us, we're always stuck in this risk is this severity times uh, probability thing. But for, there, there's a, a social context in all this, um, and that social context matters when we, we evaluate, when our values come into to the equation about determining how to manage the risks. And over the last 15 years, you know, there's been a movement to, uh, um, about precaution, the precautionary principle and way that we should be thinking about the least hazardous alternatives in all times and get that into the process as a, 
as an explicit step in the decision making around um, how we regulate or manage the, the uh, particular risks. Now, when it comes to uh, what I wanted to talk about a, a little bit, just as a reminder of where we've been over the last 15 years since I've got into this field, um, one of the major events has been this, you know, the, the movement and change in how we evaluate risk to kids. And this was a, a very important thing, this, the publishing of this report in the mid-90s, the pesticides and the diets of infants and children, was, a, was an important event. And what's interesting is, is that before then, how we evaluated how and where people were exposed to pesticides was not really a risk-based process at all. We didn't think about that. They, they calculated um, or estimated tolerances in food, but they really had no connection to the potential health implications, which is, you know, sort of staggering when you think about it. But um, it, that, that was the process. The, it was about what, um, what was most efficacious and what could be, be allowed to remain on, uh, on food as it, it left the farm gate. Um, and the two key points of this report were that, you know, we needed to account for things, all sources and pathways, how things got to humans, and then think about more than one pesticide at a time. Um, and that was a big deal in the mid-'90s, and that, that led to the passing of the Food Quality Protection Act, um, where the, we were supposed to think about what I've got highlighted in blue here, uh, aggregate, which means if, if a pesticide was used, you need to think about all the ways it was used and where you might be exposed to it. It could be coming in the air, come, could come in your food, it could, and you could get it off the carpet if you're using it in your house and your kid was playing on the carpet. I mean, this was actually where I started out on all this is what was known as residential exposure evaluation. Um, was thinking about that aggregate exposure. Now, cumulative is the big picture thing. Is okay. There's all these. We live in a world of chemical soup. How do we go about? thinking about, at least in a scientific way, the, uh, uh, the potential risks uh, from the various hazards that, that are in our environments. So um, moving from that, to what I'm calling here the recent past, to the very recent, what I'm calling here the very recent present. Um, well, I went to Chicago earlier this week. I went to talk to a bunch of people who are all diabetes epidemiologists, and they're suddenly uh, intrigued by some recent science that's come out. Um, there was a workshop by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program in January where they pulled together a bunch of experts to evaluate the, um, the science around various exposures and their um, environmental exposures and their potential effects on uh, both diabetes, which is rising uh, internationally, and uh, the obesity and, and adiposity. And what's interesting about this is they, what they did is they took the information, they got all these experts together, they, they did some work prior to the conference, but then they came down and, and needed to basically rank things. How good is the information on this, this, and this, this either class of chemicals, family of chemicals, particular compound on uh, diabetes? So um, they, they broke things into sufficient, very limited, or... Um, with very little or no data, essentially, and, and that's the three bullets. What was interesting was uh, that these persistent organic pollutants, which a lot of which are sort of these legacy pesticides that are no longer used in the United States but are used around the world. I'm talking about DDT and DDE, um, various chlorinated pesticides. There's a bunch of other things that fall into this category of persistent organic pollutants, things like PCBs. Um, but uh, the, the, some of the most interesting epidemiology uh, around uh, diabetes is, is the, the, uh, um, the relationship, for example, between chlorodane, which was long banned in this country, which is a chlorinated pesticide, it's very persistent, and uh, elevated risk of developing diabetes. Um, so um, th there's very new, people are still working on this. Now these, the, these things are very long lived in the body. Um, they're, they're still, they seem to be moving through the food chain and up into humans, but the levels, if you look over time, are, are dropping, but there's still this legacy of the, the past use, and uh, it seems to have, there's, there's good scientific evidence that there, there, there are effects that, that we can see and measure, and, and people will be continue to look at. So on this, the theme of sort of how we go about making decisions, it's, you know, there's these sort of three basic kinds of information, sort of the test tube, the animal studies, uh, 
epidemiology and what I'm calling here exposure science, which is sort of my own personal hobby horse. Um, the, the, what's interesting about this is there's, you, everybody's heard the word omics probably. Uh, does, that, does that, as a postfix to a word, does that make sense to you? Um, there's, okay, what it is is there's, we can now measure an incredible number of things. It's, there's, there's fields now called metabolomics and proteomics, which is measuring um, proteins and metabolites in the body. And it, this is this rapidly expanding field along with genetics to look at. So there's, there's this explosion of data that we can um, take a, a blood or a urine sample from somebody and look at how their detoxification systems are. Uh, and this is not just humans, it's animals and ecosystems. Uh, you can look at variants in um, metabolites or proteins and how that relates to uh, outcomes, you know, the uh, health effects in humans, health effects in ecosystems or particular animal species is a, a, a rapidly growing area that there's lots of data. Um, what's interesting about it is people don't know quite how to interpret the data. You get these beautiful, I went to Chicago, I saw these beautiful plots where <clears throat> Um, what, there's sort of two axes, and then there are these mountains of data that kind of, like the, the uh, some enzyme that detoxifies something or, or breaks down a product, with, and you'll see a mountain there. Um, they're very beautiful charts. People have no idea what they mean. Um, but it's, it's an opportunity. It's, it's where the research is going. Um, so that's one type of information. There's uh, epidemiologic studies that I've alluded to, and then exposure science which is a way to sort of look at what people are exposed to is, is things are released to the environment and move uh, into individuals and uh, in, in look at sort of disease process. And this is, as, as I mentioned, what I do um, and thinking about how, how we measure things um, and, and can use them in health studies as, as, uh, as we go forward because we want to be able to relate um, what's in our environment to uh, some sort of health outcome uh, or disease process. So um, to, to shift now, just um, what I want to talk about just real briefly is, and give you a couple of examples of, here's the whole problem when we think about uh, linking hazardous chemicals, pesticides to health effects, is, is what kind of information have we got? Um, that you can ask people questions, you can go out and do measurements in, in a variety of places. One of the things that Dana is going to talk about is, is what we call biomonitoring, measurement of um, small amounts of chemicals in, in, in the body or sometimes large amounts of chemicals uh, in biological fluids. Um, but as a scientist, as I look at the data I, and think about doing a study trying to um, either uh, look at health effects or intervene is, is what sort of information have I got? I can ask questions, I can do surveys, I can take environmental measures. Um, as you move down this slide, you go from the things that are less expensive but less specific to things that are uh, much more specific. Uh, if we can measure um, metabolites and, and parent products of pesticides in, in blood and urine now uh, via this process of biomonitoring. But that, so it's more specific, but it costs more. And, and this is always the, the struggle is, is what gives us the best bang for the buck in terms of um, estimating exposures. Now, one thing you can do is, one thing, this is, goes back to a study that I did in Minnesota um, some years ago, is uh, one I, I was associated with, it. and this is, we actually went out and counted the number of pesticide products in people's homes, and this is from what MNCPES stands for, the Minnesota Children's Pesticide Exposure Study, which is something we did in the late 90s. So what you have here on, on the, on the y-axis is, is, is it says the number of households, and the x-axis is... Um, the number of pesticide products that we found when we went out. And what you see is that most people had four, five, six various pesticide products in the house. But we literally sent somebody out and counted what they had. But you also see that we had somebody who had, I think, 37 pesticide products in, in their household, which is, is uh, not unusual. Now, what's the, the black versus the check, checkered thing here is the number of products found and then the number of products that had been used in the last year, which was part of the survey. So, um, so th this is pretty typical. And, and we found when we went out and did this, this was the late 90s, one of the things we found was a number of banned products that people had kept around their house. Um, I'd had this experience in the 80s. I cleaned out, after my grandfather died, I cleaned out his garage 
and found an old rusted uh, a container of DDT that he had had there for 20 or 25 years. When we did this study, we found some banned arsenicals um, that people had. This was done in Goodhue County, uh, Rice and Goodhue Counties in, in Minnesota, which is just south of the Twin Cities. It's near, sort of between uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Rochester, where the Mayo Clinic is. Um, so it was a an suburban and uh, rural area. And it was interesting what we found in, in people's homes. So. Um, that this is sort of one form. How, how would you relate what people have and say they've used in the last year to health is, is the question. So um, uh, moving down, if you go back to the, that earlier slide, so we, this is an inventory. We can also go and sort of take measurements on people. Now, this is actually a, a picture of my postdoc. We did a project a, a few years ago where we worked with a company that was developing a little personal monitor that I'll show you a picture of in a minute. And what she's got, Andrea's got on her, is a yellow pump. Uh, but she's also got in the middle of her, like sort of right here on her chest, she's got some of, some experimental monitors that we were looking at. And we had her go out and spray some azaleas with diazinon because we were interested in, the, um, in the performance of this particular monitor. Now, the typical technique is you go and you put a pump on somebody and you suck some air through it and you send it off to a lab and it's a relatively time-consuming and expensive process. And this was more sort of a direct read kind of instrument uh, or idea using this, this little liquid crystal monitor. And it looks something like this. Um, the, what, what's, the little black box at the top is actually a picture of it, but if you, the idea was is that the pesticides would come through the sides and uh, turn the monitor a, a different color if you looked at it under polarized light, which is what's in the bottom box there. So this was you know, an attempt to get something that was faster, cheaper, uh, that could be used easily out in the field. And uh, the, you'll forgive me for this. This is a kind of a complicated animation, but it shows you how this whole thing went together. It was a liquid crystal. Andrea, I still use this because Andrea you know, did a lot of work sort of showing how this thing worked. But the, the basic idea is you've got pesticides in the air, and they would enter this monitor and then change it, this characteristic of the liquid crystal, and then you would see what you see at the bottom here is that uh, you know, the color is changing. You can relate the distance there, the, the width of that band, to a concentration, essentially. So this would give you a, sort of a, a passive measure. You didn't need to have a pump. You could do it quickly. You could pull it out of the, uh, you, a person could wear it. You could pull it out and look at it. And there aren't many things like this. Um, and it's the sort of stuff that we need to kind of move the science forward. Um, this one, is, it turns out, isn't completely successful. There were some bugs in it, but uh, it was an interesting process. And it's the sort of thing that advanced technology can do for us, um, as, as it, at least move it, trying to move the science forward. Um, this is just a quick, from the, the Minnesota project that I alluded to earlier, the same project, we actually, we, not, we didn't just um, uh, inventory people's homes. We actually recruited some kids, a subset. There were several hundred homes in that survey. We also recruited um, kids and got urine samples out of them. And um, the ana analysis was actually done in, in Dana Barr's lab uh, when she was at the CDC. Now, what this shows you is a, this is a, uh, a picture of, on the y-axis, just the concentration of a breakdown product of a commonly used pesticide at that time, chlorpyrifos. And uh, these are, there are 102 individuals. Uh, and there's three samples from each person. And, and all the bar indicates is just the, the, the range of pesticide concentrations you, we saw in these kids. Um, so, and the, the green indicates urban, obviously, and the red is non-urban. And what we saw, for reasons that uh, at the time we weren't quite sure of, is that the urban people actually had higher exposures, uh, possibly through diet, although there's some other issues with, with the data. But I just wanted to give you an example of this is, the, this is uh, Dana will talk more about this, but um, th this is what biomonitoring can do for you. It can t tell you things about what's the range of exposures uh, and how effective um, would interventions be if, if we... And one of the interventions that's happened with this particular class of pesticides is we no longer use them in the homes as a consequence of a, of a regulatory change at, uh, in about 2001. Um, so um, there's a lot of... It, what, what I want to say uh, in closing is that there's a lot of uh, potential interesting uh, science going on. There's, uh, but the issues remain the same. We still have, uh, how do we go about doing multi-pollutant uh, 
exposure and effect studies uh, to, to uh, demonstrate either risk or safety. Um, how do we deal with effects in sensitive populations? And that's, uh, you know, kids and, and people who are occupationally exposed or may have some particular genetic um, makeup that makes them more susceptible. And what's the, what's the effect of new technology? You know, this is the things I call metabolomics, the looking at metabolites in bodies or proteins and, and the uh, change in the detoxification process. Something known as uh, uh, genome-wide association studies, this is using the modern genetics and how we um, relate that to uh, both susceptibility and health effects or where the field is moving. Um, but in the end, it's, it should all be about prevention and, and intervention. How do we, uh, if we're going to use these chemicals, how do we use them in the safest manner? Uh, with that, I want to, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, but I think we're going to move to our, our next speaker. And thank you for your time and attention. Um, just, just to put a point to one thing that uh, Dr. Adgate mentioned, um, the uh, in these persistent organic pollutants, uh, w women of, well, women and men uh, of childbearing age uh, still retain uh, many of these uh, persistent pollutants: chlordane, heptachlor, DDT. It's metabolite DDE, uh, but of interest to me as a pediatrician is that there seems to be a strong negative association of the amount of DDT, DDE that women have and duration of breastfeeding. Uh, in fact, the more DDE you have in your system, the shorter is your breastfeeding, which is a clear adverse effect on children. And the scary thing about it is we got rid of DDE Tea before all our women of childbearing age were born, uh, and yet it's still a problem. And, and this is one of the issues in this whole area. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Dana Barr, um, who worked for 22 years with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, she has recently joined the faculty of Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, uh, her research has examined the impacts of pesticides on behaviors, including ADHD, learning problems, birth outcomes, sperm quality, and more. Sperm quality is not a behavioral outcome, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> other, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Other research interests include the effects that climate change will have on our environmental exposures and how new manufacturing processes, including nanotechnology and green chemistry affect our exposures. She is uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology. And we all um, have seen her work over many years, and I'm delighted to have her here speak with you for a few moments. Thank you. I, I think while they're getting my slides up, I'd also like to just say on, on that point that you just made that not only do these women of childbearing age have these chemicals in their body, they also offset it, offlet it in their milk. And so their firstborn child gets the largest dose of those persistent organic pollutants. And fortunately, I'm a third child. But, but my brother and sister really do care about it. And so um, like... John, exposure science is kind of my hobby, and I'll either further refine that and say it's maternal and child health. And so most of my research is really focused on studying the interactions between exposures in utero or early childhood and health outcomes. I do have to point out here that, as you can see, I'm at Emory University, and my school of public health is called Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, the Rollins family, of course, are pesticide manufacturers, pesticide distributors, and pesticide applicators. Um, they invested in the School of Public Health when pesticides were being used as um, tools for trying to improve public health related to vector-borne illness. And yes, they still allow us to do health research on pesticide exposure, so that works out really well for me. So I'm going to talk to you about some of our recent biomonitoring studies 
um, that have involved pesticides and neurodevelopment in children. And as John had mentioned, there are many ways of um, assessing exposure to a variety of chemicals, but one of those ways is called biomonitoring. And that's essentially the measurement of the chemical itself, a metabolite or breakdown product or, or reaction product in a biomatrix. And it's very useful in that we get a lot of information about what chemicals actually get into people. There are some complexities in interpretation, but, but by and large, it's one of the most useful ways of assessing exposure to chemicals and, and primarily pesticides. I think it's really important for us to remember that pesticides are actually lethal by design. They were specifically designed to kill living organisms. They're one of the few groups of chemicals that have this specific purpose, and they're one of the few groups of chemicals that we introduce into the environment at our own volition and at, and at very large amounts. And so I specifically want to talk about the use of insecticides because insecticides are crafted to be neurotoxic. They're crafted to kind of hijack the nervous system and do neurotoxic effects on pests. Well, they also can exert their neurotoxic effects on humans, unfortunately. And so those are the, some of the studies that I want to focus on right now. One of the most commonly used insecticides in agriculture and until, as John pointed out, in 2001 or so uh, in residential applications are organophosphate pesticides. And here are two of the most commonly used ones. This one's called chlorpyrifos. Let's see if I can get a pointer up here. This one's called chlorpyrifos, and this one's called malathion. Chlorpyrifos is no longer used residentially. Its applications were um, eliminated in 2001. But malathion is still available if you go into any Home Depot or um, home improvement store, you'll find that it's still available on the shelf for outdoor application on lawns. What I want to do here, though, is point out the structural similarity to this chemical below. Does anyone know what that chemical is? It's sarin, the nerve agent sarin. And essentially, organophosphate insecticides are junior strength nerve agents. They were designed in the process of trying to der der derive nerve agents, and they just simply aren't as strong, but they are more effect they're more potent in, in the environment, and they last in the environment for longer periods of time. So because we use pesticides so pervasively, they are simply everywhere. They're in our food supply. They're in our grain products. Um, they are a part of public health um, campaigns to, uh, to, to um, eliminate vector-borne disease. They're applied in our homes pre-construction, post-construction. They're simply everywhere. Us as potentially not, I'm, I'm assuming most of the people are non-agricultural people in the audience, but you might not be. And if you aren't, then, then you might have various uh, pathways of exposure that are different than for the general population. But for the general population, diet is our primary pathway of exposure. And so we know that a variety of chemicals, including organophosphate pesticides, carbamate insecticides, pyrethroid insecticides, all which are neurotoxic, are found in many of the commodities that arrive in our supermarket or that are sold on roadside stands. We also have sporadic exposures from other household uses. So if you're very avid about killing your ants, if you get an ant infestation or a cockroach infestation, you're likely to have exposures, periodic exposures of more acute uh, levels. And unfortunately, pesticides are in most of our bodies. As um, we were talking about biomonitoring data, CDC has a large study looking at um, pesticide concentrations, among other chemicals, in the general U.S. population. And these are some data derived from that study. And this is looking at a metabolite of a pyrethroid insecticide. Um, pyrethroid insecticides are the most commonly used residential insecticides. And as you can see from this graph, that they're found in almost all of our bodies. What's particularly striking, and we find this for almost all of the pesticides that we evaluate, and you can see, is there another pointer? Because this is just not working that well. Is there? Is this one, maybe? No, it's just one. Just one? Oh, okay, I can do that. All right. Different mechanism here. Okay. But you can see the bottom part. How do you use it? Okay. okay, great. So you can see here that the children ha tend to have higher levels than adolescents and adults. And this is pretty consistent across the board with what we see in pesticide metabolites. 
uh, in the general U.S. population. They have behaviors that make them more susceptible to exposure, and they eat by, by body weight a lot more fruits and vegetables than do adults. Unfortunately, they're also more susceptible to the effects. So why do we care? This neurological generation process takes place um, over a period of time. It doesn't just stop when the baby is born. As you can see that there, there are a lot of... Ooh, I'm having problems with this. Okay. I'm up one, two... There are a lot of neurological processes that take place during pregnancy and during the, the prenatal and perinatal period. And so toxic insults from neurotoxics during that time period could really um, um, result in some very serious effects. But it just doesn't stop with pregnancy. In the perinatal period, we have a lot of myelination occurring, and that occurs up to about 10 years of age. And so that early childhood period is also very important. Some of the earliest data that we have that, sh that demonstrate the neurotoxicity of pesticide were, were published by Buzzy Gillette in 1998. And they show, um, she studied Yaqui tribal children in Sonora, Mexico. And in Sonora, Mexico, in this area, they, they are largely dependent upon the food supply that, that they grow there. That's, that's their primary means of income and that's their primary means of, of survival. The children that live in the foothills traditionally have no pesticide exposure because that's not the area where the crops are grown. The children that live in the valley area where, the, where pesticides are used very intensely actually have historic pesticide exposure. So she conducted a study where she asked children to draw a human figure. And these were four-year-old children and five-year-old ch children. And the four-year-old and five-year-old children in the foothill areas could draw age-appropriate um, figures of a human. But as you can see, the children that were in the valley area where they have historic pesticide exposure had um, very dramatically different drawings that demonstrated very serious neurocognitive delays. They also had de decreased stamina, decreased motor skills, and decreased cognitive development. So the exposure assessment here was fairly crude. They used pesticides or they didn't use pesticides. But the, the mechanism of getting at the neurological delays was, was very clever. This prompted the creation of three U.S. birth cohorts um, that looked at chlorpyrifos exposure, not just chlorpyrifos, but also other organophosphate exposures, but particularly chlorpyrifos exposure and health. Um, they enrolled women who were pregnant, usually in their first trimester of pregnancy, and they wanted to evaluate in utero and early childhood exposures. They used biomonitoring by measurement of the chemical or its metabolite in either blood or urine samples that were collected in the mothers throughout pregnancy as a surrogate for ex assessing exposure to the fetus. And then they collected child um, samples afterwards as well. They also collected a variety of environmental sam samples to try and understand the pathways of exposure that were very important in these populations so they, could, so they could come in and intervene and try to mitigate these exposures. They were all looking at neurological or birth parameter inputs. And one community was in an agricultural area in the Central Valley region of, of um, California, and this was in the Salinas Valley, and this was called the Chimacos Cohort. Chimaco stands for the, uh, the um, Center for the Health Assessment of Mothers and Children of Salinas, and it's also slang, I understand, for, ch for small child in Spanish. There were two cohorts that were established in New York City. One was representative of the, northern, of the regular Manhattan population, and that was conducted by Mount Sinai Hospital. And one included primarily Dominican and African American people in the northern Harlem area. And they used multiple exposure measures. So the bottom line is that they found neurological delays in all three of the studies. And this became, obviously, headline news, and people were very concerned about the, uh, the neurologic effects that pesticides would have when, during pregnancy. This first study came out in 2006, and since then, uh, there's been a barrage of studies that have come out looking at neurocognitive effects in children and in in and the exposure to pesticides during pregnancy. And these are just some of them. I didn't have time to really paste all of them on here. But these are some of them that have come out of these three birth cohorts and other cohorts as well. Specifically, these were some of the findings that they had. And I've indicated the cohort on the the uh, right-hand side here, and the outcome on the left-hand side. But most impressive were some of these cognitive disorders that were, co that were um, being realized around age three, around age five. And 
they were significantly associated also with early onset of ADHD and um, ADHD prevalence by age five in some of these birth cohorts. They are coming out now, these three cohorts are collectively coming out with a series of three papers that also show that this is very, a severe impact on IQ in these children that are now seven years of age. So you can see that there are a lot of neurological effects that, they, that have been evaluated and they've had very good and effective exposure assessment techniques that have enabled them to see these, these effects. So as I mentioned before, CDC has had as a part of its biomonitoring program the measurement of a variety of environmental chemicals in um, biological matrices, most often urine and serum, and these are representative of the U.S. population. So it's a very complex survey design that's con conducted over a period of two years. And pesticides and pesticide metabolites are a large portion of this report. Uh, they just released the last report in December 2009, and these data included some common metabolites of OP pesticides. And I showed you a structure of chlorpyrifos and I, I showed you a structure of malathion. These metabolites are common to about 29 or 39 different EPA registered pesticides. So it would indicate class exposure and not just exposure to one particular pesticide. We found um, that we could segregate some of these concentrations by age. Again, we tended to find higher concentrations in children and elderly, two of our most vulnerable population segments. And then these data were further evaluated by uh, a group, um, including Maurice Bouchard and uh, David Bellinger, who is very known neurotox, a very well-known neurotoxicologist, um, using this diagnostic and statistic manual of mental disorders to evaluate ADHD um, onset. And what they found was that um, children that had higher concentrations of these dialkyl phosphate metabolites in their urine had, an, had a, a two-fold um, increase in their odds of having hyperactive, impulsive uh, subtype of ADHD. And so these were, again, striking findings, more neurodevelopmental problems that are associated with have been associated um, with pesticide exposure. So now we know not only in utero exposure to pesticides have been associated with neurological um, delays and, and onset of ADHD, but now even early childhood exposures have been linked to ADHD. So what's being done about it? Well, as mentioned before, the EPA has reduced some of the, reg some of the re um, registrations of, of internal or in, um, residential uh, use pesticides. As a part of the Food Quality Protection Act, they had to go back and reassess aggregate and cumulative exposure. Initially, they applied a tenfold safety factor to the tolerance levels, and after supporting data, for example, for chlorpyrifos, they reduced it to, uh, back down to three. Um, so they are doing some things, and we've seen a, a marked decline in some of these chemical metabolite levels over the years. Uh, as you can see on the graph on the left, the first three bars indicate pre-Food Quality Protection Act levels of these, uh, some of these chemicals in our urine. And the subsequent bars are after the implementation of the Food Quality Protection Act. So you can see that they've markedly declined. But the data that I just mentioned and showed you here deal with the data that are after the Food Quality Protection Act. And so their current levels that they're looking at and associating with, with um, um, neurological effects and onset of ADHD. So they're probably not doing enough. We also understand more about some of these chemicals. Organophosphate pesticides, for example, are classic non-persistent chemicals. They, they tend to not persist in the environment and they tend not to biologically accumulate. We know now, though, that given the right environment, the indoor environment, that chlorpyrifos and other chemicals can last up to years. And so we may be seeing some residual exposures from its use in, in the past. Um, the other thing is that we now know that chlorpyrifos and other chlorinated non-persistent chemicals do bioaccumulate um, fairly substantially, maybe up to about 10%. And so you can have stores of these in your body that you're continually pushing into your bloodstream because they're in equilibrium with your blood over time um, if you um, reduce your exposure. So we're making progress, but probably not enough. 
And that's just in the U.S. And so there are others, other countries that have even um, less strict regulations. And one country in particular, Thailand, um, I have a birth cohort that I've just established. They're looking at the same sorts of exposures in a, a, a population that's 50 percent agricultural. And the women in that population participate dur in, the agricultural during, in the agriculture during pregnancy. And the children then uh, have the, the farms as their playground after they're born. And so it's, it's a, a, an area where uh, pesticide use is of, uh, and the effects of pesticide use is a very big concern as well. So we still have a lot more to do, but we have come a long way. So now we kind of have a pesticide toxicity dilemma. Um, Alex Liu, and I don't know if any of you know him, he's, he's uh, another one of our colleagues in exposure science who's done a lot of work. And he thinks that we're being used as the experimental rats for studying the long-term health effects of, of pesticide use. And I have to agree with him there, but I actually want to add in even something else. Since we're all unique in our co-exposures, comorbidities, lifestyle factors, genetic, and genetics, our experiment really only is an N of one with no controls and no possibility of replication. So pesticides obviously are in, in many of the things that we eat, and we have to be really careful about what we eat because, after all, we are what we eat. And I thank you for your time and your attention. That's that was another terrific talk, um, and I think sobering to all of us. Uh, one of the things that Dana alluded to, as well as John, is that uh, these are generally populations of not exceptionally exposed. These are sort of general exposures that are not very different from you and me, and um, these are really bad outcomes, but can be even worse in more heavily exposed populations. I think some of you either represent or come from some of the more heavily exposed populations. Our next talk is uh, Dr. Christine Parks, who's an epidemiologist at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I understand she's lucky to be able to talk today since they last night decided we would have a government for a little longer. Um, her research at National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, that's NIOSH, has focused on environmental risk factors for systemic autoimmune diseases. Her recent work includes uh, analyses of insecticide use and other environmental exposure in the Williams Women's Health Initiative, which um, maybe she'll talk more about it, but it's been a very, very important um, study for us in understanding women's health and uh, actually ends up having some effect on their children as well. Um, and uh, she has new research underway in the agriculture health study uh, and the NIHS uh, sister study cohorts. In February 2001, she published a study showing a link between exposure to household pesticides and certain autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus. Um, Christine, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, and um, I'm really honored to be here um, with you all um, and sharing this work with you, and um, as a public servant, not just a citizen scientist. Um, I, is somebody going to help me get my slides up? <laughs> Do I need to press something? I did give my slides to someone, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so my nerves are a little shot after the last 24 hours, 48 hours, where I've given been given various instructions as to whether I could speak here. So I'm, anyway, very grateful to speak. Um, and I'm going to see if I can figure out how to use this and speak at the same time. Um, so I'll be talking today specifically about um, our findings on insecticide use and risk of autoimmune rheumatic diseases in the Women's Health Initiative. And does this, does what switch is it? <laughs> Just click here. Oh, click here. Okay. And the pointer is there. All right. The pointer is this thing. Daha, thank you. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, first I'm going to um, give you a little background on autoimmune rheumatic diseases, which is really where I came to this from. I'm not a pesticide expert yet. 
Um, but I've done a lot of research in autoimmune diseases, and um, the diseases I'm going to talk about today are those that um, overlap with the rheumatic diseases. They're known as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, and a broad number of other rarer, mostly rarer, um, systemic autoimmune diseases. And I'm going to try to race through a little of the background, because I know we're late, um, uh, just talking a little bit about evidence for genetic and non-genetic risk factors for these diseases, and then focus in on the results for insecticides um, from the Women's Health Initiative, and then end a little summary for you. So, uh, The systemic autoimmune diseases are characterized by production of specific autoantibodies. These are um, antibodies to yourself, like DNA, uh, things that you ought not to be making antibodies to normally in high levels. Um, they're characterized by self-reactive immune cells, and this activity leads to systemic inflammation and can involve multiple organ systems. Um, for lupus, this results in a wide variety of systemic effects, including arthritis. Um, and for rheumatoid arthritis, which is the oh, whoops, wrong. Okay, for rheumatoid arthritis, which is the more common of these diseases, um, you'll see the characteristic involvement of the small joints, um, first starting with swelling, but after years of disease, which can evolve into a deforming arthritis. And you may have seen people with this, um, or know people. Um, in terms of the epidemiology, these are individually uncommon diseases, though not rare. Rheumatoid arthritis in the general population affects about one in 100 people, um, which is about 10 times more frequent than lupus. However, the lifetime risk of any one of these autoimmune rheumatic diseases is actually quite high, with recent evidence suggesting one in 12 women will develop one of these in their lifetime and one in 20 men. They have substantial impact. They're disabling. They have high cost to individuals, families, and society. People often live with them for a long time, though they do have a higher risk of death and risk of developing cardiovascular disease, cancers, some cancers, and infections. That said, there are few established risk factors. What we know is that women tend to be at higher risk, especially for lupus, for example. Nine out of ten patients are female. Older age is a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. And then for some of these diseases, having non-white race or ethnicity is a risk factor for having developing the diseases and having more severe disease. The other thing we know is that having a family history of them increases your risks, and that's led to a lot of research on genetic risk factors. And we know that many, many genes are involved, shared by multiple diseases that can overlap even in families and in individuals. But it's more than just genetics. Um, studies of identical twins show low concordance rates. That is, both twins don't get the disease. Um, and here you can see an example for some of the, the diseases here, including lupus and RA. Um, oh, I didn't expect that to be there. Um, <laughs> they're complex diseases, like many chronic diseases, and we know they're caused by interactions of multiple factors, including gene-environment interactions and environment-environment interactions. But what do we know about environmental risk factors? Not a whole lot. There's pretty convincing evidence now for inorganic silica exposure. That's quartz, um, including some data on mechanisms and some interaction data suggesting smokers have higher risks. Smoking is a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. Then it gets a little fuzzier, but sunlight exposure and infections are all areas that people have looked at. And we get clues from epidemiologic studies where we study patterns of these diseases, who gets them, who doesn't. You know, it's not causal, but we get clues as to what some of the causal agents might be. So farming occupation, we've known for some time that it's associated with autoimmune rheumatic disease risk. And people have wondered, could this be due to pesticides? We know farmers have higher level ex exposures. I don't need to tell you that. But they also have exposures to a number of other risk factors, such as these dusts like silica, sunlight, infections, and a number of other factors. And it can be really hard to separate the role of pesticides from farming. A meta-analysis conducted almost 10 years ago showed across a number of studies that farmers had a significantly increased risk of disease. And I don't know how many of you are epidemiologists, so I was going to try to just point out um, you're going to see odds ratios and risks ratios, and a ratio of one means no, no association, and higher means it's positive. 
If you have a confidence interval that doesn't include one, then it's statistically significant. So what you can see here is that for farming, they have found fairly consistent findings, and it's significant across multiple studies. For pesticide exposure, what data was out there was a little less strong. There have been several recent studies since then that show fairly consistent evidence for farming, at least in men, but less consistent evidence for occupational pesticide exposure. And there are a lot of challenges to conducting this research. Few studies directly measure exposures, and farming and other occupational pesticide exposures are relatively uncommon, especially in women who are at most risk of these diseases. In contrast, as we know, residential exposures are common, such as insecticides. They're less concentrated, but often similar chemicals. And um, as we just heard earlier, household exposures are widespread and can be frequent and persistent with less degradation indoors with these material reservoirs. So they're a substantial exposure source. And with that in mind, I was very excited to find out that the Women's Health Initiative observational cohort had collected data on residential insecticide exposure. So now I'm going to tell you about this study. Overall, this is an arm of the study. There are many arms of the study. Some went towards clinical trials. These are women who weren't enrolled in the clinical trials but were enrolled at the same time and followed over time for some of the same health outcomes. There were over 93,000 women. They're postmenopausal. They were enrolled in the mid-90s and followed up yearly. What we had here in this study were um, over 76,000 women who were at risk of developing RA or lupus. And we developed a case identification algorithm based on self-reported diagnosis of RA or lupus reported for the first time, not at baseline, but in the first three years of the, the study. And then we confirmed this diagnosis by looking at what medicines they were taking. There is a very specific group of serious medications that tend to be used for these diseases. And we identified 213 women who had developed new cases of disease, um, mostly rheumatoid arthritis and a few lupus. And in general, this was about one new case per 1,000 women in the cohort per year. That doesn't sound like very much, but remember, it adds up as these people um, go along. We had self-reported exposure data at baseline. Um, they asked if you, a woman had ever lived or worked on a farm and for how many years. And then in the first follow-up questionnaire, they also asked this very broad question, have you or someone ever sprayed, poured, mixed, sprayed, or applied insecticides? And then they specified this um, to be in your immediate surroundings at home, leisure, or work. And then they specified what they weren't looking for. For those who answered yes, they asked them more information on location and types of exposure, whether they were personal exposures or others applied them at their home or work or other commercial applications. And then they also asked questions about duration and frequency of these exposures. Just to start, you know, because we started at this with the farm question, we did look at um, the farming exposure, and we saw that women with... Um, Let's see if I can do this again. 20 or more years of farm history, though it was rare, they had a twofold increased risk of becoming a case. This was significant. When we adjust for covariates, um, and that's this long list of other risk factors, um, we saw a slight diminution of this effect. Um, that's known as confounding, but it basically means that some of this risk was explained by some of these other risk factors. Interestingly, though, when we adjusted for the insecticide exposure variables, that association, that twofold association, almost completely goes away. So that was intriguing. Um, but what we were really interested in was these personal insecticide use data. And what we saw was, is that coming up on there somewhere? Okay, we saw that 33% of the cohort with these data, they reported never using pesticides. That's probably an underestimate. But, um, and what we see here as you go down in these columns is the percent of people who reported longer duration or more frequent exposures or use. And you can see that you had a twofold increased risk of developing these diseases if you had longer term exposure with a significant trend or more frequent exposure, again, a significant trend. And that this was not explained by any of the other covariates that we looked at in our models, 
including farm exposure. When we looked at application by others, we didn't see a significant trend, although longer-term exposure um, seemed to be significant on its own. These weren't significant trends, but there was nothing going on for frequency, and that may have something to do with the diversity of different types of exposures that were being uh, reported in this question. This slide shows a cumulative exposure index combining duration and frequency of exposure for personal use and commercial use. And here I've separated out the two diseases to make a point. Um, you see for rheumatoid arthritis a significant trend for personal use, not for, for the application by others. And you see a very similar trend for lupus. And this is important because, you know, we combined them in our initial overall analyses but we had so few lupus cases, you know, we weren't sure if we would see it separately for them. And to see it separately in both groups kind of increases our confidence that maybe something's going on underlying both of these autoimmune diseases. Next, what we did was we stratified our analyses by farming. So we looked at women who never lived or worked on a farm, so trying to get rid of those other farm exposures that we might not be controlling for. And um, we see, again, a significant trend for personal use um, in those who had never lived or worked on a farm. And we also see um, a higher risk for those who ever lived or worked on a farm for personal use. But then, oh, where's that arrow? It jumped out at me that actually we saw a significant trend for application by others or commercial use. And this may actually reflect, you know, application on the farm. Um, and this was significantly different. So, so there may actually be something going on there as well. We did break that down and look a little bit more, and we saw it both for frequency and duration of use um, in these farm, farm women. And when you combine this, actually, these women are the ones with the highest risk who had ever lived or worked on a farm and had high or very high level of exposures. Um, but we still see it in women off the farm. So in summary, um, these data show that insecticide use is related to autoimmune rheumatic diseases in postmenopausal women. Um, this has captured a lot of people's attention and been very exciting. And um, I am also happy. <laughs> I was surprised. I mean, we see very, what I would say for an epidemiologic study, pretty convincing um, data on dose response. Um, that higher doses, especially the personal use scenarios, are resulting in higher ex uh, risk of disease, and we see it consistently for both outcomes. Um, we saw that this was not due to farm history or any of the other covariates, so it wasn't highly confounded. And the highest risk was in those women with the highest potential exposures, those with the farm history. However, the, the limitation, I would say the main limitation is these are self-reported exposures. We know these kind of data are fairly reliable um, from other studies, but they're nonspecific. They're, they're very messy, <laughs> um, what people remember reporting. And we had no specific data on pests or products. And there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know what specific chemicals might cause disease and how or what mechanisms are involved. When is the relevant time of exposure? Is it in infancy and childhood when the developing immune systems or hormonal systems are, are laying down their, their lifetime patterns? Or is it nearer to disease onset, maybe in the context of other disease triggers? We also don't know a lot about effects in susceptible individuals. You know, is the effect stronger in those who have a family history of autoimmune diseases? Many people do. Is it stronger in aging populations? We saw our effect in postmenopausal women um, is it stronger in people with other immune disorders, in women, or is it also seen in men? Many questions remain. What we do know is the findings suggest this potential effect of widespread, ex widespread exposure on disease risk, and the results are consistent with previous finding on farming as a risk factor. It's supported by some limited evidence, which I can't talk about right now, but maybe in the next session. Um, on the immunotoxic effects of some of the insecticides. It's very limited data specific to autoimmune diseases, though. And then there's some intriguing connections through, you know, what we know about pesticides and cancers of the immune system and autoimmune patients also having higher rates of those diseases. And finally, you know, these individual diseases may be uncommon, but together they actually represent a much larger 
uh, group of chronic autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases that affect many, many people. So the public health impact could be substantial. More research is needed on environmental risk factors and autoimmune diseases to improve our understanding, but also to raise awareness and get this into the risk assessment world as well. And um, I want to acknowledge everyone who contributed to this particular study, and then my colleagues at NIEHS, Dale Sandler and Jane Hoppen. And um, I will stop there. I have other slides, but we can talk about those later because I know we're very behind. Thank you very much. That was a terrific talk. Um, our next speaker is Chang Lung Wang, uh, who is an entomologist and extension specialist at Rutgers University and an actual expert on bed bug control. Dr. Wang's, Wang's research focuses on developing new and improved urban pest management technologies through the study of biology, behavior, and ecology of urban pests. His goal is to identify cost-effective and environmentally friendly solutions that will benefit the consumers. Currently, his research is focused on bed bug and cockroach resistance to commonly used pesticides and least toxic control strategies. Uh, it, it, I hope that it's fairly obvious the reason we're having him speak uh, is that the resistance of these is leading to much higher exposures, uh, potentially much higher exposures to pesticides than you've heard in the three preceding talks, and if uh, the push to use more of more toxic pesticides results from these patterns of resistance, we may have even more problems with what you've heard about, and he is going to offer us some alternatives to these chemical-intensive approaches. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, really uh, glad to be here and see all you know very different uh, groups of people. Uh, I'm an entomologist. I have always been studying urban uh, insects uh, since 1998. I studied uh, termites, ants, uh, cockroaches, and then you know, recently bedbugs. So it's a natural transition. Uh, since 2008, um, that was the first time I encountered the bedbugs. So there were thousands of bedbugs in one apartment. They come to us to you know, ask uh, what to do with the bedbugs. Then I moved to um, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey, actually, uh, if you visited some of the communities, you would find that uh, it is very diverse, and some communities have a very high level of um, bedbug infestations. So there are, if you visit there, you will see, have a better appreciation of you know, why, you know, we have so much, you know, bad bug problem at this time. There are many reasons, but one of the reasons is the resistance issue. Um, we, you know, I do a lot of um, uh, field work. People use a lot of pesticides. Uh, the more they use, actually, the more is the problem. So that's actually why we have to uh, address this issue. Uh, this, I think this is a good venue for us to uh, discuss. Okay, this first picture show you in the 1950s and 1960s, this is how um, bed bugs are controlled. Actually, it was quite easy, uh, quite effective. Only one or two treatments would uh, solve the problem. But uh, pay attention, see how they apply the dust. This is the DDT dust. Applied, um, the left picture shows directly on the mattress. Uh, the right picture, you know, on the baseboard area, the floor. Uh, also pay attention, see the two ladies, they didn't uh, wear any, say, gloves or masks. They are wearing, you know, short sleeve shirts and skirts. You know, it's total, you know, violation of current uh, labor requirements. So at that time, basically, we really didn't very care much about uh, the pesticide exposure. Uh, plus, oops, where's the next Okay. Uh, plus, you know, many insects, uh, including bed bugs, can develop a resistance very easily. Uh, in the first uh, uh, 
application of DDT in the U.S. was in 1944. Then only after three years, the resistance issue show up in a military uh, station. Then in the 1950s, there are many other countries also reported uh, the uh, resistance to DDT because DDT was the most effective and uh, also inexpensive material for uh, bed bug control at the time. But after that, uh, you know, the organophosphates, carbamates, and then pyrethroids began to show up. So all these chemicals together basically uh, eliminated or suppressed the bed bugs to very, very low levels. So for about uh, 50 years, we really never hear about uh, bed bugs again in the U.S. or in many other industrialized countries. But in, say, Asia or some African, African countries, there are still some populations you know, around. There was only one um, report about uh, tropical bed bug resistance to pyrethroids. Uh, that was in 2002. So they found that you know, after five years of use of treated bed nights, then the um, bed bugs began to be resistant uh, to the pyrethroids. So I think that's one of the reasons why we now have so much resistance issue because uh, other countries are still using chemicals a lot to try to you know, kill bed bugs. Uh, the recent report about the bed bug resistance uh, showed that uh, uh, one population had more than 12,000 times resistance compared to the lab strain. So basically, the chemical is totally useless. Okay. And another study, this was in 2008, they found uh, you know, more than two times resistant uh, um, you know, to uh, a chemical called diatomethrin. By the way, diatomethrin is one of the most common pyrethroid used in homes. Um, if, but actually, this chemical supposedly to be only used by professionals in the U.S., but in other countries, everybody can use it. So they, they don't have much regulation in other countries. Then uh, last year, there was another study also showed uh, you know, thousands of uh, times of resistance to uh, diatomethrin and uh, uh, lambda cyclothrin. Uh, both are also commonly used in the U.S. Uh, and very recently, uh, the uh, student from University of uh, Kentucky found that uh, uh, more than 88% of the field populations that they collected in the U.S. had the mutant, uh, mutant genes that are responsible for resistance to pyrethroid. Uh, they collected more than 100 populations all over the U.S. So you can see that uh, majority of the bed bug populations are already resistant to the pyrethroid uh, uh, chemicals. And also you have to remember, pyrethroid uh, chemical is the uh, only uh, major category that is allowed to use in the U.S. because we are, you know, U U.S. EPA already banned, uh, banned the use of uh, OPs and uh, carbamates. But then, you know, people have much less choice, and this actually uh, increased the pressure, uh, you know, also help uh, develop the resistance levels. So uh, we certainly, you know, need uh, some other, you know, alternative strategies. And before we go to that, uh, let's discuss about uh, the mechanism, so why the insects uh, develop a resistance, um, how they develop a resistance. Uh, the first uh, mechanism is that uh, uh, the target site becomes no longer sensible, sensitive. Uh, for example, say the bed bugs. Uh, the target site, site uh, basically the mo molecular structure changed so that uh, the pesticide no longer can bind that site uh, firmly. So that way, uh, the pesticide will no longer have the same effect to that uh, target site. Uh, a second mechanism is that, uh, uh, you know, insects always have uh, all kinds of enzymes, like us. The enzymes are responsible for detoxifying the, um, say, foreign materials that enter to the organisms. So for insects, one of the major categories of the enzymes are called uh, cytochrome P450. So this uh, basically family of enzymes had um, a major effect in the detoxification of pesticides. About uh, probably 90, 90 species of insects were studied thoroughly uh, by entomologists. They showed that uh, P450 is uh, 
responsible for uh, the uh, detoxification of uh, uh, the chemicals. Still, we need to study you know, specifically which enzyme is responsible. But certainly, uh, we know that uh, P450 is one of the major enzymes that uh, leads to the resistance. The third mechanism is that uh, uh, the bed bugs developed a reduced uh, penetration, which means, uh, see, uh, the bed bug skin, we call a cuticle, now it's become thicker, so the chemical no longer be able to penetrate the body easily as possible, as easy as before. So less chemical can enter inside the insect body. That way, you know, they absorb much less, uh, you know, when you apply the same amount. So they become, you know, uh, less likely to be killed. There are some factors that associate the, the speed of uh, resistance uh, development. Uh, one is that uh, the intensity of selection. To say the more often we use the chemical, um, if we also, say, use only one kind of chemical, so one type of chemical, then they are more likely to de develop a resistance. It makes sense. Uh, same as human. So if you, you know, use the same antibiotics, you certainly will develop a resistance. Uh, the second factor is uh, the insect reproduction rate. Uh, for example, mosquitoes, flies, they can develop very fast. So these insects would develop a resistance much faster than the slower uh, development, uh, say, ins insects, such as, say, American cockroach. It's very difficult to develop a resistance. But the German cockroach can develop a resistance very fast because they develop much faster. Also, the frequency of resistant gene in the population. So naturally, some individuals are resistant, but if these individuals, uh, you know, are um, very common, then the whole population will become resistant very fast. Also, the nature of the gene. Uh, dominant genes certainly can prevail much better than the recessive genes. So if we say the gene responsible for the resistance is controlled by a dominant gene, then you would have the uh, uh, resistant population very easily. Uh, among these four factors, uh, we cannot do anything about the last three factors. But the first factor is what we can control. So we can do something to reduce the resistance by, you know, avoid uh, the selection of uh, resistance. So one of the ways we can do this is to use non-chemical and integrated uh, pest management. Uh, this would, uh, you know, reduce the pressure to uh, the, you know, resistance selection. They can slow down the resistant uh, uh, development. They can also reduce um, or eliminate the health and the environmental hazards, such as, uh, you know, the pesticide residue or even the direct, uh, you know, exposure where you apply the pesticides. Also, you can uh, improve the long-term efficacy. Uh, you know, like uh, ant control, cockroach control, mosquito control, all uh, the success is dependent on how you reduce their breeding sites, their hybrids, and um, their you know, uh, factors associated with their development. Chemical is just the last result that to control them. Um, there are some very effective and very simple non-chemical control methods and tools, such as uh, physical removal, uh, laundering, drying, uh, reducing clutter, uh, disposal of uh, infested uh, items or ceiling hybrids. Uh, here shows, you know, you can just place a cover over the bed so you don't have to treat the bed or you don't have to throw away the mattresses. Uh, house steam is also very effective. Uh, I will talk this uh, in the afternoon. Uh, that's uh, the control section. Uh, now I want to show you a recent study we tried to compare three uh, different uh, control strategies. Uh, the chemical control, non-chemical control, and uh, uh, IPM, which is uh, integrated uh, pest management. And the goal of this research is we want to see whether we can achieve the same effectiveness without using the chemicals or use uh, reduced amount of chemicals. So the chemicals we use are two commonly um, pesticides that are used by the industry. One is called um, uh, temple dust. Uh, the other is called a suspend. 
And then uh, the non-chemical control included uh, the encasements. I showed, you, showed, uh, um, you see the picture that uh, before. Uh, an insect uh, interceptor, basically it's a dish that you can place under the uh, furniture legs. Then we use the hot steam and also weekly uh, laundering by the tenants. Uh, the IPM uh, treatment uh, included uh, both non-chemical and control, I mean uh, chemical control methods. This was done in uh, low-income housing in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, see here it shows the results. Uh, basically, uh, we selected 27 apartments. Each group had nine or eight apartments. Uh, the non-chemical uh, control uh, group, uh, we used um, actually um, the apartments with less uh, lower levels because uh, uh, it's more easily to control uh, the infestations when the numbers are relatively low. But when the numbers are very high, then you certainly need some chemical. But anyway, you can see that uh, after two weeks, all the three control methods resulted in a, a very significant reduction in the populations. And then at uh, week eight, uh, all became zero. Uh, the vertical bar is the uh, geometric mean of uh, bed bug count. Uh, it's one way to count uh, uh, the bed bugs. So basically, you can see that uh, all treatment uh, methods can uh, reduce or eliminate bed bugs to you know, uh, very low level or no you know, bed bugs at all. But there are still some bed bugs present in some apartments. Uh, the reason is because uh, you know, these are low income uh, housing residents, so they, there are a lot of different challenges. Uh, the left picture is a um, person who uh, was disabled, so he basically accumulated um, lots and lots of uh, you know, clothing and um, sheets, uh, dirty, you know, items on the floor. So, what? Yes. Uh, so we, every time we went there, you know, it's there. We want to throw away or want to um, bag them into, you know, garbage bags. The person refused because uh, he actually still used that. So um, we have to just leave it that way. We cannot control it. Um, we cannot apply any pesticides to, you know, the clothing. So that's why, you know, like this apartment, uh, is, we spent um, probably six months to get rid of all the bed bugs. Uh, the red picture is a, a lady who is healthy, active, but uh, he just uh, is too uh, lazy, and uh, he just uh, hoarded lots of uh, items uh, in her apartment. Uh, just look at, uh, you know, how many TVs he, she has. She certainly, you know, doesn't need uh, so many TVs. That's just in one of the rooms. This is the living room. Uh, also, at uh, this location, we found uh, many um, uh, bed bugs. This was uh, you know, a pile of uh, newspaper and uh, other papers. So this is the challenge why you know, we cannot uh, eliminate uh, the bed bugs in some apartments. Um, Recently, we also did a survey of the residents, you know, what chemicals they use. Actually, a lot of people, you know, try to control bed bugs themselves because it's cheaper, uh, it's, um, you know, immediately effective, they think. But, you know, a lot of the chemicals they use are either not safe or not effective at all. This table shows you 20% um, of the survey, the residents use the pyrethroids usually those over-the-counter products. And many of the products, uh, remember, they, they don't have a label for bed bugs. Uh, they use the bleach, alcohol. Certainly they are not effective. Uh, some people use the professional products, and they certainly, you know, if you use them, you need a um, license, but, you know, the residents don't have a license. Um, boric acid dust is not effective at all, but people use it. Uh, here shows an example. In the left picture is a lady holding a um, kitchen cleaner. She said that she used this uh, whenever she finds bed bugs, and then she no longer had uh, problems. But, you know, if it is that effective, then we certainly don't need uh, any other chemicals. Uh, the, left, the right picture is a, uh, basically is a fogger that used by a resident. 
He used this kind of program many times. But we never see any scientific study showing Fogger can uh, eliminate or control bed bugs in apartments. And but people still using uh, Foggers. Uh, this person in this apartment uh, applied um, basically a band of boric acid dust uh, at the entrance door. So he says, because his neighbors had bed bugs, he doesn't want uh, bed bugs to come into his apartment. Um, the person living in this apartment uh, used the suspend uh, spray many times. He said uh, weekly, basically. Uh, you can see, you know, the bed frame become very rusty. This is from the passive use. So in summary, uh, we certainly need educated public so that they know what to use. They know the consequences of, uh, you know, the pesticide application. Not just, uh, you know, damaging the furniture, but also they pose potential risks to themselves, to their children. Also, uh, a combination of several simple and non-chemical methods can eliminate uh, bed bug infestations, as uh, we just see in that study. And control can be both uh, affordable and effective. It's just a matter of you know the biology, you know, you know the different techniques, and then selectively use different techniques to you know, um, control bed bugs without uh, using chemicals or use minimum amount of chemicals. So that's the end. Thank you. Um, so those are four wonderful talks. Um, we had, we have planned to have a uh, a uh, question and answer panel, um, but we're up against a very tight schedule. So. Perhaps if there are uh, four or five uh, brief questions while we're waiting for Dr. Coburn to prepare her talk, we could do that. And he could direct them to any of the speakers, all of whom are here. How does diatomaceous earth work on bed bugs? Uh, I think that's the only chemical I would recommend uh, to the public. So use the DE dust, uh, that would be very effective, yes. Can you explain how that works? How, that works? how do The mechanism is to uh, basically cause the insect to lose water because so, you know, it's abrasive. How you use it? Um, use a duster is best. It usually comes with a bottle, with a nozzle. Uh, the nozzle is okay, but uh, it's not as good as a duster. Yeah. But you can use the bottle itself. Uh, apply to the perimeter of the floor uh, very lightly. A light color is enough, uh, almost uh, invisible. Uh, always uh, apply to the cracks, crevices, like uh, behind, the, um, say, the baseboard, uh, the odolites. All the odolites, I would say, just treat especially those around the, the bed and the sofa. Um, if you want to apply to the bed, only apply to the cracks, crevices, not to the mattress. Because when you sit on the mattress, the dust will come out. Uh, when you apply it, uh, wear a mask. Okay. Uh, but generally, it's relatively safe compared to the organic chemicals. I would say much better than the, than the other chemicals for the general public. You know, professionals can use a different dust, but um, you know, for the general public, it's not good. What do you get? How do you um, it? What's it garden shop, yes. Dietary dust. It's used in swimming pools, I think. Okay, right. so wait. Let's. You, you can buy. We're, we're yes. recording this session, so if you're going to make a comment, you have to have the microphone. Okay, two more questions. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering on your graph um, showing how effective the different approaches were, I noticed that for IPM, after eight weeks, it started going up again. Yeah. Why? Uh, statistically, not different. It's just uh, 
you know, I showed the challenging situations. Uh, there are some apartments that have uh, had, uh, you know, very, you know, cluttered items. Uh, you know, they don't wash. Those are the, you know, factors contributed to the, you know, sustainable population. Uh, some apartments had a bed bath for two years or even longer. So okay, one more question. Yes. I'm sorry to, to push, but uh, we, I, I should tell all of you that we're having a, a workshop uh, with most of these folks uh, right after this, and you're welcome to go to the workshop, and I, you'll get a lot more chance to interact, and they're all going to be around, so you can ask some of your questions one-on-one. -on -one. Quick question, I guess for Dr. Adgate, on the slide on uh, diabetes and environmental chemicals. So it, it said that there was a causal link between um, POPs and, and actually causing diabetes. But then below in talking about OPs and BPA and phthalates, there was just, a, I guess, a link between to, to obesity and glycemic control. And I guess I'm just wondering if you could, if you could tease out a little bit what, you know, what the differences we're talking about between just causing ob you know, obesity and glycemic control versus causing diabetes. And so would it then be incorrect to say that, you know, OPs are linked to diabetes, too. Just trying to use the information responsibly. Um, that's a long, complicated question that I have to give a short answer to. Um, that, that slide summarized a whole lot of information from this workshop. And um, I know less about the things in the bottom of the slide, just as a, as a precursor. Those are the things, I mean, what they did is they looked at all the available literature and then made these judgments about the quality of the evidence, essentially. Um, so that, you know, their judgment was the things at the top of the slide, there, were, there was a reasonably good evidence of, of these things. The things at the bottom of the slide, there were, um, of which the things you were, you were related to um, more directly now, are there's less evidence, and it's mostly in animals, and it's inconsistent. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're going to have to have a longer conversation about this. Uh, you can, if you just Google the words NTP, NIH, NIEHS, and, and uh, diabetes, you will go to the website that has all the materials from that meeting from which I have uh, extracted what ended up on that slide. Um, so, the, the, you know, we can have a longer conversation uh, about this. Um, but so, it's, it's an area of ongoing research is sort of the basic answer. 